Good morning. My name's Sarah. I am one half of Two Pills in a Pod, which is a podcast I normally make with my friend Paige. I'm doing another bonus episode today, and I'm talking about a project that I've done before, and this has sort of become a bit of an unexpected sequel, and that is me talking about my slipper socks. So in at some point last year, I made this video. It was really fun to make. It's been really fun to see all of the responses to it, mainly because I am so in love with these socks. I'm so happy with how cozy they are. I'm so happy with the prospect that there's other people in the world who have cozy feet now because these socks are just the best. I love them so much. Um, when I initially made that video, it was very much a beginner. It was a documenting, you know, their uh, clueless voyages. But I am now older and wiser and I have made 10 more pairs, not 10, I've made, I think I've made five pairs now. Uh, and I feel like I am in a better position to update some of the things that weren't clear in the first video, update on a lot of the questions that I got from people who are also making them. Um, and so I thought I would talk about that a little bit more because I'm currently in the midst of making another pair in my quest to cover my entire family in slipper socks. So yeah, for the uninitiated, this pattern is the Doppler Toffler Slipper Socks by Sanders Garn. It was a free pattern that was sorry, it is a free pattern. It was initially only available in Norwegian. And so a big part of this first video that I made was about addressing the fact, sort of deciphering the pattern based purely on the verbal translation that Inga from Knitting Traditions did. It has since been released in English. So that's really taken a lot of the challenge out for some of the numbers and some of the explanation about decreases and picking up stitches, that sort of thing. I still find that probably a lot of the art of these socks and getting them in a good state and, and getting a final project product is probably not captured in the instructions. So the instructions will tell you the basics, but I th this is something that I feel like now that I've got a bit of experience, I'm in a better position to say what worked for me and what kind of made all the difference to help get these from a funny knitted shape into a beautiful felted shoe. The recommended yarn is their yarn called Frittet's Garn. Oh, Frittet's Garn, which I think apparently means like leisure yarn. Um, this is 100% Norwegian wool and it recommends a five and a half mil needle. It's quite a lofty, chunky yarn. Um, I think I've, I've only ever used Fritjits Garn, which is a bit of a pain to get in Australia. But I think in theory, the priorities that you want from a yarn, if you're going to substitute, is something that is def like definitely not machine washable because it needs to be feltable. It needs to be fairly chunky and it needs to be quite sort of uh, lofty. Uh, this is how this is some leftover and you can see it's quite airy and lofty um, but hello but it's anything that's similar probably is going to work ultimately I think I've seen people do lots of different things but as long as the most important thing is that it is a feltable yarn and not some sort of super wash treated machine washable yarn because it's never gonna the fibers are never gonna felt together but yeah so I thought I'd talk a little bit about the pattern how to knit it up like how it knits up and then how you turn that into a a shoe so if you follow the instructions from Sanders Garn, and I always, I always put, it's free, so I always put in my Ravelry the numbers that I use for the ones that I'm making. So if you wanted to go and see sort of details about picking up stitches and numbers and stuff, that's all on there. But 
This is a pair that I'm making for my little brother. It's the largest, I'm doing the largest adult size. So if you follow the pattern, you cast on at this top point here and then you knit the body in the round until this sort of dividing point. You then put half the stitches on hold and then you knit one forefoot and then you shape for a toe as you would normally and then knit a second forefoot. So you get to this point. The key and then from there, the way that it turns into, it goes from this into something a little bit more like this, which looks a bit more like a shoe or a sock, is these two, this is the heel on, because it's double sided, these two heel points go together and then this forefoot gets tucked inside this forefoot. Now the men's, the men's, the largest men's size uses like 4.1 balls of the fritted scarn. So rather than break into another ball, I just use some scrap left over from actually from these ones. So, and given you're not going to see it, it seemed like a good use of scraps. But basically what you do is you, at this sort of middle point between the two four feet, you sort of pinch it in half and tuck one inside the other so that the heel corners are connected at this point. Then one of the four feet, probably the one with a weird toe, gets tunneled in and tucked inside the other. And you're left with something that looks like this. From here, it's in a, good, it's in a state that you can take it to the washing machine and start the felting process. Some of the key things that I've done to modify my socks or modify the pattern a little bit since I've made it a few times now is I always use a Judy's Magic cast on at the top here. The pattern just gets you to cast on in the round and then knit and then at the end go back and seam this up. But I'm happy to avoid that step if it gives me a really nice seamless finish. The other things I do is for the second forefoot, the one that I know is going to be the one that's tucked in, I cast on two less stitches or I pick up two less stitches at the join so it's a little bit smaller and I knit two less rounds. It just makes it a tiny little bit smaller so that when you tuck it inside it's a little bit easier because it's got to fit inside the other forefoot if that makes sense. So it doesn't make a huge amount of difference. I've made lots of pairs where I haven't done that, but now that I'm making more of these, I've found that if it is a little bit smaller, it's easier to fit it inside. I also took two rows out of the body and I moved them to the four feet just so that I could shift the opening of the four, the opening because I found in my first pair that the, the, the foot hole that is created was a bit big and I really wanted it to start a little bit closer to my ankle. So it's because it's such a simple shape, it is easy to make those changes, which is really nice. The other things I do is before I put this in the washing machine is I sew the two toes together and the, the two heel tips together. And that just keeps the, keeps the socks together in the shape that they're meant to be in these two anchor points while it's being roughed up in the machine. Again, it's not essential, but it just helps and makes your life a little bit easier. So when it comes out of the machine and you need to shape it and smooth out all the wrinkles, that it's kept that shape a little bit. But yeah, they're the main things. I love this pattern. I love how it turns out. They're the main things. And let's go to the washing machine and I talked a little bit about felting. Okay, so back on my bathroom floor um, to start the process of felting these. I have sewn in the anchor points at the heels and toes and I've just um, like thread the, the ends into the middle. I don't need to worry about weaving them in because they'll just felt with the rest of the fabric. But 
I've gone it down a little bit of a rabbit hole when it comes to felting and the theory behind it and what is important for felting. So basically, I don't know if you've seen those electron microscopy images of fibers like hairs or wool, but they've got scales on them. But basically what happens in the felting process is the scales that normally wrap around the core fiber of wool or hair or anything, um, when they are exposed to heat and agitation and moisture will fluff up and kind of splay out is my understanding. And then from there, once they are splayed out, they're more likely to catch onto other scales of, of like neighboring fibers. And it is that process of the scales of the wool fiber being uh, irritated uh, and agitated enough that they'll latch onto each other when they're in that state of being moist and hot and roughed up. The reason that some fibres felt better than others is the size of the scales and the, um, the pointiness and the willingness of those scales to, to fluff up. So for a superwash treated wool, for say, that is one where the scales are, have been treated so that they are less jagged and less likely to fluff up. That's why it's a fire. That's why those fibers can undergo those uh, really, what's the word, like rough environments of going through a washing machine, all that agitation, all that heat, and still not felt because the the fibers have been treated such that the scales don't act as they normally would. But because we are working with a fibre that is specifically has big jagged scales in a coarse wool, and it is a fibre that has not been treated, so the scales are ready to like puff out and latch onto each other, we're in a good position. The key aspects of, of felting, therefore, to create that scaly puff is heat, moisture, and agitation. We achieve that in a washing machine with obviously water, the temperature of the water controlling that and creating agitation by making sure that the thing that we're felting goes in with something else. So uh, I normally use towels, so I'm gonna put two towels in with mine, but any laundry that you've got that's sort of a bit hardy or a rough fabric is gonna be helpful. So I know Arne and Carlos will use old pairs of jeans or something. That's a really good thing to really create some of that texture and that friction to promote the fibers felting together. There's also sort of some evidence which suggests that if the moist, if the if the water is slightly more alkaline, and the pH is a little bit higher, that does also promote um, fi fel uh, the fiber felting. And so that's why we'd always also use a little bit of soap to kind of help bring the fiber, uh, so bring the water up to the pH a little bit higher. I think ultimately you don't need all of those things to achieve felting. So like once I, the last pair of slippers I made, I think I did in cold water just out of curiosity. It still felted. I think it just took a little bit longer. Like I needed to run a longer cycle to get the same effect. So finding that balance between those three things to felt it without over felting it, um, I think is a little bit of trial and error. If you have a top loader machine, that's awesome because you can monitor your felting process a little bit more. Front loaders have more limitations because they're locked between cycles. So generally what I do is I will run a 30 minute cycle and check on it every 30 minutes to see how much it's changed. Uh, if you are making a lot of these and you know what's gonna work for your machine, obviously you can put it on for a longer cycle, but this is what I do to just sort of monitor it. I think ultimately it's better to err on the side of over felted than under felted because especially if you're using it as a gift because the wool is such a malleable stretchy fabric after it's been felted that you do have a lot more wiggle room with that garment than you might think. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit later but I think ultimately don't hold back. I'm going to put these ones on for their first 30 minute cycle and I will get back to you after 30 minutes. I'm probably going to run this at maybe 40 degrees and we'll see what happens.
Later that same evening. I have put these through their first 30 minute cycle. There's definitely a little way to go, but you can definitely tell that the felting process has started. So there is some, still some stitch definition, but it's certainly, it's shrunk, it's, and the stitches are starting to blur together, which is a really good sign that things are heading in the right direction. I feel like I'm feeling bold, so I'm going to probably aim for like a one hour cycle at maybe at 40 degrees again and come back then and see what they look like. The next day. Okay. We're back, it's the next day, we're done. The slippers are out of the machine, they're dry, and they're here. They are definitely felted. Um, they are probably, they're probably over felted, to be honest. Um, when I compare them to the pair I did, these, this is my pair, they're a little bit smaller and my brother obviously um, has much bigger feet than me. So, but as I mentioned before, in my experience now, I think it's better to err on the side of overfelted than underfelted, particularly like in this instance where I'm gonna be posting these to my brother who lives in London. He is not gonna be in a position, like I don't trust him to, to do extra felting. So if they were too big and they were underfelted, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to I wouldn't want to burden him with burdens a bit dramatic I wouldn't want to have to, for him to have to finish working this project himself and put it through the machine and worry about felting but by over felting them and this is what happened actually with the pair I did for my parents both of my parents pairs over felted a little bit and were too small when they initially when I initially gave it to them but by soaking these in some warm water, no soap, no agitation, but just like dunking them so that they're soaked and uh, stretching them. So what I did was I just really kind of put, put my fist in the end and really pulled it to stretch it out a little bit. It's actually incredible how much give these have when they're wet. And what I found was I was able to stretch them enough that they were able to go over my parents both my parents feet really snugly and then as Inga from Knitting Traditions recommends you um, put some like some really thick sport socks or something over the top and allow and get the socks get them to wear the socks with the sport socks over the top which further will mold the socks to the shape of their feet making it a really good fit and making it really cozy and not too oversized and roomy but just right because it's being molded onto their feet when they're wet. And so that works really well for my parents. And so I'm going to go by the same principle for my little brother that it's better to over felt because you can stretch it. And because this fabric is so malleable when it's wet, which is actually like amazing how much it's stretched out. So that's going to be my instructions that I'll include with these when I get them in the post. They'll also probably need a shave. Like when they come out of the machine, they're real fuzzy. Um, so it's probably good just to give them a little, a little brush and a neaten up. But as another pair done, another great success. I ended up doing a total of about two hours in the machine. I did a half hour, then a one hour, then another half hour just to really shrink them up. All, all cycles I did it sort of between 30 and 40 degrees and all with two towels in there as well. So that's what's worked for me. Um, if you, yeah, see so how you go. So the other thing I wanted to mention was about potential yarn options. So I bought a heap of Fritz yarn all in one go because it was a bit difficult to get in Australia. And so I've never tried anything else, but I have had a look online and I have uh, sort of assessed, um, you know, on Yarn Sub and a few other things. And there's plenty of options that would work for this. This is a really sort of flexible pattern in terms of what's uh, what would work. I, as, as I said, the most important thing is that the it's not a superwash yarn um, and it's in that sort of bulky, rough, coarse, woolly texture uh, category. Uh, I know that Drops Alaska works. And then one that's in Australia is called 
Norway. It's from Morris and Sons. But I'll also include a few links down below of some other recommended yarns to maximise potential options for this yarn. But if you've got any questions, I really enjoy replying to them. I think this is a really sort of fun challenge for me is to be as confident and as knowledgeable about this pattern as possible. And yeah, the other thing is I went down a bit of a rabbit hole last night and I started playing with Excel and I'm a, I'm a big Excel fan. I'm a big formula fan. And I started playing around with some of the sizes and some of the provided measurements for the different sizes of the pattern. Someone messaged me in the comments of the last video and was looking for a smaller size than the smallest size listed in the pattern. And I have subsequently done a little bit of calculations in terms of the number of rows and the length of the foot before and after felting and the percentage shrinkage and stuff. So I've made that into a, I've made it into a Google sheet, which I'm going to pop a link to in the bottom. So if you want to have a play and get like, if you're unclear about what size is going to be good for you, or you do want one of those smaller sizes or theoretically a bigger size, if you expand the formula out the other way, then have a play or message me and I'll have a play as well because I, uh, I love a spreadsheet. Um, but that's everything I wanted to mention about these. Thanks everyone again for continued support of the channel, for lovely comments, um, for the positive feedback on the first iteration of this video when I made my first pair. Thanks to everyone who tags me in pictures of them, which I really love. Um, and I'll see you soon with Paige for another regular episode soon.